Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Saturday, March 11th, 2023. Hope everybody's doing well. Wanted to come on and talk briefly uh, about this topic that I've talked about before. This deals with African empires that Europeans tried to claim as their own. Some of these are well-known nations uh, besides Egypt, besides Kemet. Others are not so well known. OK. And then also uh, I'm teaching an online history class today, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to start a little bit after 2 p.m., about 2.15 or 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. So I'll give you some uh, information about that. All right. So uh, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, we know that Europeans have tried to claim uh, Egypt as their own, uh, try to claim Kemet as their own. And they said that these were uh, brown skinned Caucasians um, and, and different things of this nature. But uh, some of these other uh, African empires, uh, a lot of times we don't know that Europeans try to claim these as their own also. Um, and one of them would be Nubia. OK, uh, so Nubia exists. Nubia also uh, you hear the term uh, Tanehesi or Taseti because Nubia is a Greek word. Uh, Nubia existed from 4500 BC before the Common Era or BC before Christ to 500 AD. All right, and there was a there was a video that I showed uh, that I posted uh, on our fan page, the African History Network. I uh, posted this uh, back in I think it was November or so. And it got a, a over fifteen hundred likes, and it's um, it's a video of a scientist who realized that the um, ancient Egyptians were not Europeans or were not brown skinned Caucasians. Scientist disappointed when he finds out that ancient Egyptian pharaohs were black Africans. Okay, so we have more and more archaeological evidence coming out every other week uh there was just one discovery coming out of uh egypt in the past couple of weeks dealing with the new chamber found in the uh great pyramid at giza pyramid of khufu all right and we'll talk about this in in my online class as well uh but i, I want to show this video here uh quickly of and let me go to it here let me pull this up. i want to show this video here quickly of um, something, th th this discovery that came out. Okay, let me go to this here just a second. Let's try to pull this up here. I'm still trying to get used to uh, this new laptop as well. Uh, where is it? All right, just a second here. Okay, let's pull it up in Google. I guess I have to pull up in Chrome. All right, just give me a minute here. And everybody share this broadcasting on social media platforms. Also invite your friends to tune in as well. All right, let's go to this and I'll start it from the beginning. Well, they have just told me that uh, Shemai had a Nubian feature, which means that um, their ruling family was probably Nubian, and th that was unexpected. Examining Shemai's anatomy closely, the thickness of his bone and the shape of his nasal cavity, the anthropologists think he was a black African, likely from neighboring Nubia. A huge revelation that challenges the prevailing image of the Egyptian ruling class. We always thought the ancient Egyptian elites were Mediterranean type. And in this sense, Shemai is representing the society of, uh, of the frontier in which different ethnic uh, groups were mixed. At the end, it doesn't matter the color of your skin. Shemai was Egyptian. OK, but but then he said at the end, he said it doesn't matter the color of your skin. Shemai was Egyptian. OK, 
uh, because he he really does not want to deal with the fact that these were black Africans. All right. And these are games that we see played. OK, these are games that we see played with uh, by European anthropologists and, and archaeologists, et cetera. All right. Uh, so I want to go back to uh, Nubia here. So ancient Nubia or Ta Seti, also known as Kush, which was a region more than a country. Kush uh, was a region along the Nile River located in northern Sudan and uh, southern Egypt, located in northern Sudan and southern Egypt. It was home to some of Africa's earliest kingdoms known for rich deposits of gold, uh, Nubia was a major trading port for luxury goods that came from sub-Saharan Africa, such as incense, ivory, and ebony. So the lower portion of Egypt today and the upper portion of uh, the Sudan is what traditionally was known as uh, Nubia, okay, or, or Ta Seti. That, that's the region that you're dealing with. Now, we know that the most of the geographical boundaries that we see today in africa most of that is the result of the berlin conference of uh, 1884 and 1885 okay in uh berlin germany and this was a conference that uh was held to carve up africa into colonies okay divide africa into colonies and there was no African representation um, at the Berlin Conference. All right. So uh, you're going to have these uh, Europeans divide Africa uh, up into uh, colonies because they have been fighting and killing each other over hundreds of years over the riches of, of Africa. OK. And they realized that they didn't have to keep uh, fighting and killing each other. They could carve Africa up and largely stop the killing. All right. Now, th there's a good article from uh, let me pull this up here. There's a good article from uh, thought.co uh, dealing with the Berlin Conference. Of 1884 and 1885 and it shows you uh, a map of Africa and it shows you the different regions that the different European nations got as a result uh, of the Berlin Conference and let me pull this up right here you could check this out as well so we, we talk about this especially in the uh, we, we deal with this in my 12 week online course ancient Kemet the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, but also in the second class that I teach on Sundays, um, black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution to the U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement, because that deals with history from 1800 through 1968. OK, this one right here, done with the Berlin Conference. Purpose of the Berlin Conference in 1884 at the request of Portugal. Uh, now, now, the Portuguese were the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade. It's important to understand. Uh, they get involved in 1441 when Anton Gonzalez goes into Mauritania and takes out 12 Africans and takes them back to uh, Portugal. German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck called together the major Western powers of the world to negotiate questions and uh, end confusion and end confusion uh over the control of africa german chancellor otto von bismarck appreciated the opportunity to expand germany's sphere of influence over africa and hoped to force germany's rivals to struggle with uh one another for territory okay so uh, at the time of the conference 80 percent of africa remained under traditional and local control what ultimately resulted was a hodgepodge of geometric boundaries that divided Africa into 50 irregular countries. This, this new map of the continent was superimposed over 1,000 indigenous cultures and regions of Africa. The new countries lacked rhyme or reason and divided coherent groups of people, of African people, 
and merged together disparate groups who really did not get along. Okay, so then they show you the map here and they show you uh, they have a color coded scheme uh, here. They show you the map and they list the names of the different countries that got different uh, areas of Africa, different regions. Okay, so check that out. That's at thought.co.com, um, the Berlin Conference to Divide Africa. All right, let's continue here. Let's go back to the PowerPoint presentation. And in, in the online course, there's over 200 slides that we have in it as well. I've been teaching this class um, going back to 2017, and it, it has evolved immensely since 2017. Okay, so can everybody see me okay? And how's the audio? Let me know. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. Now, evidence of the oldest and let me check and make sure that's the right next slide hold on it is advanced too far here we go now the first monarchy of recorded history was established in nubia uh the nubians were also uh known for their exceptional archery skills that provided the military strength for their rulers kings of nubia ultimately conquered and ruled egypt or kemet for about a century for about a hundred years Monuments still stand in modern Egypt and Sudan um, at the sites where Nubian rulers built cities, temples, and royal pyramids. Now, in the 1800s, uh, the Western world's interest in Nubia was awakened by the rediscovery of the ancient empire's monuments, which were reported almost simultaneously by individual British, French, and American explorers. Many of them found it difficult to credit indigenous Africans for building such a civilization, okay? So once again, they were saying that these, these Africans who, these Negroes who are enslaved, they can't be the same Negroes that, that built uh, these great civilizations, okay? But they were, these are African people. All right. And as invasions take place in Kemet, OK, as invading forces come in, those Africans, they're going to move uh, uh, to the south. They're going to move into Nubia as well. But they're also going to go into Central Africa and West Africa. We know that the Yoruba were originally in ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. We know that the Dogon of uh the, so the Yoruba who are in Nigeria, the Dogon who are in Mali and Burkina Faso, they were originally in uh, ancient Kemet as well. So we're going to see as invasions take place that Africans are going to flee also. We and and also you you have voluntary migration. Af African people didn't just stay in one area. We migrate as well and, and we circumnavigated the globe. All right. So um, visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. You can register for this 12-week online history course that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Now, the Ma'afa is a key Swahili term which refers to our Holocaust, the great, the great disaster, the transatlantic slave trade. I teach this class on Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And this class is Saturday, March 11th, 2023. So we're having class today. As soon as I finish this broadcast, you can join us. Uh, the class is on sale, $80, regularly $130. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. And we also have a bundle pack of courses. So you get uh, this one and the one I teach on Sundays uh, for $120. That's a $300 value. The one I teach on Sundays is uh, Black Resistance Movements from the Haitian Revolution, the Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. And we go through and look at history chronologically from 1800 to 1968 to see uh, what happened, what leads up to the transatlantic, I'm sorry, what leads up to the Civil War taking place. Uh, what happened to us after slavery ended uh, as well? What were the laws and policies put in place to bring us to where we are today, to put us in the predicament we're in today, to understand where we need to go from here? Okay, so we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. 
and uh, you can go back and watch it uh, anytime. OK, so that's uh, Black Resistance Movements and Black Resistance Movements was the uh, 2023 annual theme for Black History Month. And I did a, a series of free lectures dealing with Black Resistance Movements black resistance movements also but this is a class that i've been teaching since 2021 and uh for this year we have a a, a specific focus on black resistance movements as well so you can register for both of those classes at the african history network.com uh the content is pg-13 you can use this with your children also okay so uh, it's not vulgar i don't do a lot of cursing or anything like that we have the information here in the thread of the broadcast. You can join us for today's class. Uh, also, we'll get started about 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, I'm going to post the link here again uh, in the thread of the broadcast here. OK. All right, let's continue. So uh, during the 1840s, German Egyptologist Carl Richard Lepsius uh, who lived from 1810 to 1884, asserted confidently that the Greek term Ethiopian, when referring to the ancient civilized people of Kush, did not apply to Negroes, did not apply to Negroes. OK, now um, we know that Nubian is a Greek word, but also Ethiopian is a Greek word also. And at one time, uh, all of the continent of Africa was referred to as Ethiopia as well. All right. So here, here you have them once again trying to divide and say, oh, well, the Ethiopians, uh, uh, the Ethiopians are not Negroes. The Ethiopians are not Negroes. OK, these are all these are all African people. So uh, Carl Richard Lepsius asserted confidently that the Greek term Ethiopian, when referring to the ancient civilized people of Kush, uh, did not apply to Negroes, but was used to describe reddish skinned people closely related to the Egyptians who he said, quote, belong to the Caucasian race, end quote. So when we go through and, and study this history, we're going to see a concerted effort to section off the not just the ancient Kemetic people, not just the ancient Kemites or ancient Egyptians, but also the Nubians section them off from uh, what Europeans refer to as sub-Saharan Africa and say, oh, well, these, these people up here, even though this is in Africa, this is, no, they, they're different. They're uh, brown-skinned Caucasians or they're reddish-skinned people or they're Semites or something like this. These are not the Negroes like the ones you see enslaved uh, that, that Europeans uh, started enslaving in the transatlantic slave trade. These are totally different people. Not true. These are these are African people as well. Now, uh, Nubia was the first recorded monarch or monarchy. Ancient Egypt is the first uh, uh, major civilization in Africa for which records are abundant. It was not, however, Africa's first kingdom. A March 1st, 1979, New York Times front page article written by journalist Boyce uh, Rensberger reported, quote, evidence of the oldest recognizable monarchy in human history preceding the rise of the earliest Egyptian kings by several generations has been discovered in artifacts from ancient Nubia, has been discovered in artifacts from ancient Nubia. The artifacts, including hundreds of fragments of pottery, jewelry, stone vessels, and ceremonial objects, such as incense burners, were initially recovered from the uh, Cousteau uh, Cemetery by uh, Keith C. Seale, S-E-E-L-E, -E -E, uh, a professor at the University of Chicago. Okay, so what is a monarchy? Some people may ask. Now, a monarchy is a political system based upon the undivided sovereignty or rule of a single person, okay, where you have a king who has total authority, um, the or a ruler who has total authority. Uh, the term applies to states in which superior authority is vested in the monarch, an individual ruler who functions as the head of state and who achieves 
uh, and who achieves his or her position through heredity, through heredity. So it's passed down uh, father to son, father to son, or it could be, you know, mother to daughter, mother to daughter. If it's a queen who's a monarch as well. Most monarchies allow only male succession, usually from father to son. So Britannica.com, uh, official website of the Encyclopedia Britannica, has some good information on uh, a monarchy and what a monarchy is. Now, the New York Times had a very famous article from March 1st, 1979, okay? Uh, and this is by um, uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Uh, ancient Nubian artifacts yield evidence of earliest monarchy. Ancient Nubian artifacts uh, yield evidence of earliest monarchy. And in this article from the New York Times, March 1st, 1979, it says evidence of the oldest recognizable uh, monarchy in human history uh, preceding the rise of the earliest Egyptian kings by several generations or pharaohs or in the Subites by several generations has been discovered in artifacts from ancient uh, Nubia in Africa has been discovered in artifacts from ancient Nubia in Africa until now it had been assumed uh, that at the, that at that time, the ancient Nubian culture, which existed in what is now northern Sudan and southern Egypt, had not advanced beyond a collection of scattered tribal clans and chiefdoms had not advanced uh, until now. It had been assumed that at that time, the ancient Nubian culture, which existed in what is now northern Sudan and southern Egypt, had not advanced beyond uh, a collection of scattered tribal clans and chiefdoms. Now, the existence of rule by kings indicates a more advanced form of political organization in which many chiefdoms are united under a more powerful and wealthy ruler. So this is something that I've talked about before when we deal with the uh, pyramid principle that comes from uh, two of my teachers, uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Professor James Small. OK, and we deal with understanding how the foundation uh, is African history and culture. And this gives us a. Uh, our values, our interests, and our principles, our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. And this influences the two sides of the pyramid. So here we see the pyramid of Khafre at Giza. Um, and we see Heron Maquette in front of it, the, the, what, what the Greeks call the Sphinx. The two sides of the pyramid are economic empowerment and political empowerment. It's, it's African history and culture that gives us our values, interests, and, and, our, and our principles, our VIPs. This gives us a cultural paradigm that we see reality through. It's our history and culture that gives us our self-esteem, our self-development, our self-worth. This influences the two sides of the pyramid, which are economic empowerment and our political empowerment. Our history and culture influences how we engage in economics and influences the type of businesses that we have and the structure of those type of businesses, especially dealing with the co-ops, the co cooperative economics, which comes from the co-ops. And the cooperative economics is a, a principle that we brought with us from Africa to this country. And we have a deep, rich history of cooperative economics, whether it's the free African society. Of 1787 was well, it's the Colored Merchants Association in 1928, the Colored Farmers Union of about 1886 or so in Texas, which grows to 1.2 million members. But also understanding political empowerment, political instructions and under, political structures and understanding how politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power and resources. And the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, their adoption, interpretation and enforcement. So our understanding of our history is directly related to our political empowerment, how we engage in politics, our understanding of politics, and 
uh, your understanding of politics is directly related to your understanding of history because laws and policies shape conditions and historical events and historical movements come out of those uh, conditions to get laws and policies put in place to address conditions. So many people, many of our people, unfortunately think that we can just deal with African history and culture and not deal with politics. That's a falsehood. I don't know what would lead you to believe something like that. Or some of our people think we can just deal with economic empowerment and not deal with African history and culture. And they're, and they're dressing up white capitalism in red, black, and green and passing that off as black empowerment. That's not black empowerment. That's just white capitalism dressed up in red, black, and green. That means you don't understand. You haven't read Dr. Dr. Jessica Gordon Emhard's book, Collective Courage, A History of African-American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice, which deals with the a history of the co-ops and it deals with how we brought these principles of cooperative economics from Africa here. So we have to have a synthesis of all, we have to have a synthesis of all three of these, not just one, but it's African people who created political structures, who, who created political governments. Okay. We, we, we didn't, we didn't just have culture and uh, playing the drums and African dance. We, cre we created societies that have political structures as well. So, but we, so we were the first politicians, but also we created economic structures also. We were the first entrepreneurs. We were the first agriculturalists. We were the first farmers. So we have to have a synthesis of all three of these, not one or two of them. All right, give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, on this uh give us a like on this broadcast you could post your comments here also we'll be here for a few more minutes and then uh who still needs to register for the uh 12 week online course that i teach on saturdays 2 p.m eastern standard time today we're going to start at 2 30 p.m eastern standard time march 11th 2023 ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school uh we have the link here in the thread of the broadcast so you can register for the course and then uh, also I'll post the link here again. We have the information uh, at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. We have the information there. Classes on sale, $80, regularly $130. And uh, you can, all the sessions are archived and recorded. We do the sessions live. They're all archived and recorded. So even if you can't join us in class live, it's not a problem. You can go back and watch the class anytime, okay, whenever you get ready to. All right. So uh, back to this article from the New York Times from March 1st, 1979. Um, this article entitled Ancient Nubian Artifacts Yield Evidence of Earliest Monarchy. Now, until now, it had been assumed that at that time, the ancient Nubian culture, which existed in what is now southern Sudan and southern Egypt, had not advanced beyond the collection of scattered tribal clans and chiefdoms and chiefdoms the existence of rule by kings indicates a more advanced form of political organization in which many chiefdoms are united under a more powerful and a wealthier ruler the discovery is expected to stimulate a new appraisal of the origins of civilization in africa OK, the discovery is expected to stimulate a new appraisal of the origins of civilization in Africa, raising the question of to what extent later Egyptian culture may have derived its advanced political structure, its advanced political structure from the Nubians. So in ancient Kemet, they didn't just have pyramids and Netaru and deities and, and agriculture, they had a political structure also, an advanced political structure. When we look at Ghana and Songhai and Mali, we see an advanced political structure also. And we see advanced civilizations there at a time, especially like it uh, with uh, uh, Mali when uh, Mansa Musa becomes emperor of the Mali Empire in 1312 AD. 
Europe is in disarray at this time in dealing with famine and civil wars, etc. But West Africa is thriving. The discovery is expected to dis to uh, stimulate a new appraisal of the origins of civilization in Africa, raising the question of to what extent later Egyptian culture may have derived its advanced political structure from the Nubians. The various symbols of Nubian royalty that have been found are the same as those associated at later times with Egyptian kings. The discovery is expected to stimulate a new appraisal of the uh, origin. I'm sorry, the same same slide. Um, the new findings suggest that the ancient Nubians may have reached this stage of political development as long ago as 3300 BCE, before the Common Era, or BC, before Christ. Several generations before the earliest documented Nasubiti or Egyptian king. OK, um, the discovery is based on study of artifacts from ancient tombs excavated 15 years ago, 15 years prior to 1979 in an international effort to res to rescue archaeological deposits before the rising waters of the Aswan Dam covered them. OK, so th this is an, this is an article from March 1st, 1979. Ancient Nubian artifacts yield evidence of earliest monarchy. OK, so then we also have um, Carthage. OK, and in the class, we talk about Hannibal Barker. We talk about the Battle of Canaan 216 B.C. Um, and Hannibal crossing the Alps as well in 219 B.C. And the Battle of Zama 202 B.C. where Hannibal Barker is defeated by Publius Cornelius Scipio is going to be after the uh, Battle of of Zama in 202 BC that Publius Cornelius Scipio takes the surname Africanus, okay, because Africanus, because Africa is not named after Publius Cornelius Scipio. Um, it's the other way around, all right? And th this is why you have to understand language. Uh, you can consult uh, Cassell's Latin English Dictionary, uh, 2002 edition, page 11, in the entry for a fear and it tells you the uh, definition of Africa. Okay, page 11. This is Publius Cornelius Scipio. His family's last name was Scipio, not Africanus. And he takes his surname, which means belonging to Africa or of Africa. And in the entry for a fear on page 11 of Casal's Latin English Dictionary, it tells you that uh, Africa uh means belonging to uh, the africanus means belonging to africa all right so somehow this all got twisted around and people think that the word africa is named after a roman general no that's that's false and the prefix afri is in reference to the afri who were a group of black african people in algeria and tunisia uh, Tunisia is in North Africa. Tunisia is in the area that used to be called Carthage. Uh, pages 14 and 15 of African People in uh, World History by Dr. John Henrik Clark. Dr. Clark talks about the Afri, okay? Uh, and he, he, and he, he breaks down uh, some of this information here. All right, so uh, we have Carthage, we have uh, 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 Nubia. And Europeans tried to claim Carthage as their own, okay? There was a series that the History Channel did in 2016, I think it was, 2016, called Barbarians Rising. Barbarians Rising, and it deals with 700 years of invasions uh, of the uh, invasions of the Roman Empire. OK, then leads up to 476 A.D. when the rest, uh, western portion of the Roman Empire is, uh, Empire is crushed by the Vandals and the Visigoths. And it deals with uh, they talk about Hannibal Barker. And they have this black British actor named Nicholas Pinnock portray Hannibal Barker because Hannibal was African. And you have some white people on social media who lost their minds and said that Hannibal was white and. The History Channel was lying and it was revisionist history, things like this. 
um the famous carthaginian was a thorn in the empire the roman empire side he became a general at the age of 26 and managed to unite barbarian tribes to stop rome's imperial rise the military genius was famous for climbing the alps with war elephants whose sole purpose was to stop the roman empire hannibal ultimately wanted to invade rome but he failed to do so um read the article from june 7th 2016 from atlantablackstar.com history channel portrays hannibal as black white people cry foul over historical revisionism but carthage exists from 813 bce to 146 bce carthage is going to be destroyed by the roman empire all right and carthage was founded in the ninth century uh bce on the gulf of Tun on the gulf of tunis from the sixth century um onwards it developed into a great trading empire covering uh, much of the mediterranean and was home to a brilliant civilization in the course of the long punic wars which are from 264 bce common era to 146 bce carthage occupied some of rome's territories before finally being destroyed by its rival rome in 146 bce in his book world's great men of color volume one uh, history scholar A.J. Rogers asserts that Carthaginians were descendants of the Phoenicians, a Negroid people, and that, in fact, until the rise of the doctrine of white superiority, until the rise of the doctrine of white superiority, Hannibal Barker was traditionally known as a black man. Today, many encyclopedias classify the Carthaginians as whites or Semites, but ancient Greek and Roman eyewitness accounts paint a different picture. The indigenous peoples of Carthage were called the Afers, A-F-E-R-S, the Afers. Ancient Roman poet Virgil in his poem Mortem uh, speaks of a woman from the Afer or Afar or Afra race. And he says of her, uh, and quote, and all her figure proves her native land. Her hair was curly, thick her lips and dark her color, uh, end quote. The library of, in the library of history book, uh, 20 Roman numeral XX 20 X represents 10. Okay. In the Roman, uh, Roman number system, Greek historian Diodorus mentions a Greek Lieutenant named Agathocles who defeated a people in the area of present day Tunisia, present day Tunisia, who were the same hue as the Ethiopians. Now Tunisia is the area where Carthage was historically. OK, the eyewitness accounts are corroborated by physical anthropology. L, the initial L, Berthelon and E. Chantre, both well noted French anthropologists documented their examination of skeletons throughout uh, North Africa in all periods. They note that the remains of both upper and lower class individuals of ancient North Africa were representative of the Negroid race. So we see this attempt to rewrite history, to take these civilizations that were traditionally African, but black African people, not Europeans, not brown skinned Caucasians, not reddish Caucasians, anything like this. OK, and we see this attempt to divide them from the people that Europeans call Negroes. Because they don't want you to know those are those are the same people on those. Those are the descendants of the same people who that you are enslaving. OK, because Africans migrate from the Nile, from the Nile Valley region of Africa into Central Africa, into West Africa, and they go all around the world. Just like the Twa, uh, who Europeans derisively call pygmies. OK. And these are uh, the Khoisan, who are the short statured Africans. And this is who Dr. David M. Hotep uh, talks about in his book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. OK, and Dr. David M. Hotep is a friend of mine. I've interviewed him probably 13 times on the African History Network show. And on page 14 of his book, he deals with uh, evidence that was discovered in 2004 by Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. And they found in Allendale County, South Carolina, at a campsite, they found 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence that date back 
dates back at least 51,700 years ago. And they found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints, and lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, uh, linguistics, painting, skull, skeleton, structures, and tools. Okay. Now, his book is backed up by seven peer reviewed articles and 713 footnotes. Now, you can read this article here from ScienceDaily.com. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. This is from November 18th, 2004, which deals with Dr. Albert Goodyear's discovery. Here's a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear. He's a white, a white archaeologist whose research is at odds with the establishment in archaeology. Now, an October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. Here are a couple of uh, Khoisan women right here. All right. So hopefully you all like this type of information. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. Those watching, post your comments here. Um, who still needs to register for the 12 week online course that I teach on Saturdays? Uh, and I'm about to jump off here and teach this course at our online school. Uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We'll post a link here. Classes on sale, $80, regularly $130. Um, and we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. Visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, okay? And uh, you can also email us right through the website as well if you want to register for this and you want to uh, pay in installments. Also, we can set that up for you uh, also. Sundays, I teach um, from the Haitian Revo uh, uh, Black Resistance Movements, from the Haitian Revolution to the U.S. Civil War, uh, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement, okay? And that class picks up where this one leads off, and we focus on Black Resistance Movements. And Black Resistance Movements is the uh, 2023 annual theme for Black History Month or African American History Month. So I did a series of free lectures during February tied to Black resistance movements, okay? So check out our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. You can register for that second course also, and we have those in the bundle pack uh, as well, bundle pack of courses. Uh, if you want to support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us stay on the air, keep broadcasting, upgrade equipment because I, I had I just had to buy a new laptop last uh, weekend. So that's why this, uh, the, the bit quality of the video is sharper and the audio is much better. I had to invest in this laptop, didn't want to spend the money, but I had to. Uh, we have the link for PayPal and Cash App here. Our, our Cash App link is dollar sign the AHN show S H O W. Dollar sign the AHN show S H O W. When you go to it, it says Michael and shows my picture there. Uh, a lot of times it'll show my picture. Uh, these here on the screen and uh, it's like three other three others I have identified are fake African History Network Cash App accounts. I'm, I'm still trying to get shut down. So Cash App has opened up a um, investigation but they've been stealing money from us okay we have to get out of here i have to go teach this class remember right now it's correct wrong behavior it's not over till we win we're kind of forever and we'll talk to you next time peace